It is my absolute pleasure to um, introduce you to this very special plenary keynote, um, which is a casual chat with a focus on North America titled Reflecting on Open Education in North America, where it's been and where it's headed. And we'll be joined by two very lovely US-based OER advocates um, who will share a little bit about their experience with us today and really help us understand the North American perspective a bit more. Um, just a few housekeeping notes. Um, we will have the chat and please feel free to at any time post your questions in the chat already. But it would be really lovely if after the actual chat, you just open up your microphone and join us and share your questions live with us. So join us on the stage. In case you are traveling and you're not able to turn on your microphone, I'm more than happy to also read out your questions from the chat. So then without any further ado, a warm welcome to Nicole Allen and Regina Gong. Welcome to both of you. Hi. Great to be here. Hi, everyone. Welcome. <laughs> Fabulous. Thank you. So to start it out, to start us out, um, can you each introduce yourself and share what beverage or snack you've brought? Maybe Nicole, can you go first? Yeah, so hi everybody. I'm uh, joining you from Providence, Rhode Island in the United States. And uh, I work as the director of open education at Spark, which is a, a library membership organization that advocates to make open um, re education and research open and equitable by design. And uh, this uh, afternoon, it's 4 p.m. for me. I am currently drinking. Um, uh, I, am, I am an avid wine drinker, but I am currently not drinking wine um, because I've been alcohol free for most of the pandemic. I'm currently drinking tart cherry juice, which is my favorite sort of um, evening um drink that I like to sip it's um it's very um tart <laughs> um and uh I uh have also since I am drinking fake wine um I have also brought fake cheese <laughs> um which is um my favorite uh my favorite snack uh cheese balls fabulous Regina what about you yeah, well, thank you. Thank you for the invitation. <laughs> and um, I hope you're not uh, too traumatized hearing me sing <laughs> earlier. <laughs> <laughs> well, anyway, my name is Regina Gong. I am coming from um, Okemos, Michigan. Um, it's I am the Open Educational Resources and Student Success Librarian at Michigan State University. And like Nicole, it's 4 p.m. or 4.04 here uh, from where I live. So I am drinking um, San Pellegrino Limonata. So it's kind of like a little bubbly. And also because I really like dark chocolate. So I am having a piece of Godiva. Uh, what is this? Roasted almond dark chocolate. So yeah. Oh, fabulous. Lovely drink and snack for an afternoon. It is, I'm actually here from Germany today and it's 10.05 PM and it is very, very cold. And I recently moved back to Europe from India, so I have hot tea to keep me warm. Um, and I see we have Joran sharing that he's drinking a cold mate and has a mango salad waiting next door. Wow, <laughs> great. Anybody else, if you have a beverage or a snack, please let us know. We're happy to be in the loop. Um, otherwise, um, so the two of you, um, you know, you've been both involved um, in the open education movement. Um, and I would love to know, you know, how did you come to be an open education advocate? Yeah, thanks for that question. Um, so I'll go first. And my story starts when uh, I was an undergraduate student in the mid 2000s. And uh, like many students uh, across the, the U.S. and, um, uh, you know, also in, in Canada, this is a big challenge. 
uh, I was absolutely shocked by the cost of textbooks for my education. You know, I still remember as a freshman going into the bookstore that first day of school and um, just being uh, uh, completely outraged that, you know, a math textbook back then cost $150, but, you know, now that would be probably double that price. And throughout my education, I just sort of, um, it just never made sense to me why uh, we are, are talking about giving students a 21st century education, uh, but then we're using these like expensive, like old, outdated print textbooks. And it just sort of never made sense. And when I graduated, I actually got involved in student organizing, working with an organization called the Student Public Interest Research Groups. And through that work was advocating on, on higher education affordability and ended up uh, uh, helping to launch a national student campaign against the high cost of textbooks. So, you know, recognizing that this, you know, this, this problem is outrageous and we should have solutions to this problem. So uh, that was around 2006, 2007. And in 2008, the Cape Town Declaration on Open Education came out. And that was a really important moment for the open education movement because it sort of galvanized and articulated the vision for uh, you know, what, what open education is. And um, uh, we uh, ended up focusing uh, the work of students that, that you know, we were working with at campuses across the country to advocate for open textbooks. So uh, I ended up working with students at over 100 uh, colleges and universities across the U.S. to go to faculty and, and, and talk about this idea. Back then, you know, the kinds of examples we had, we had, you know, maybe five examples of open textbooks that existed. Um, and, you know, at the time we were saying, uh, you know, if these five open textbooks exist, then we can totally, you know, make more and, and find more in, in these courses. And um, it's just been amazing to see over time how the open education movement has evolved and how librarians have gotten involved is a huge part of, of driving uh, the movement in North America and how students continue to be a key part of, of what's leading this movement. So, um, you know, I came, I came fresh, fresh out of being a student advocate into uh, basically driving open education for, for my entire career. And it's just, you know, inspiring to, to be part of events like this, where there are people all over the world who, who are working to advance, um, advance open education in, in, in solving whatever challenges, uh, you know, you're facing in your part of the world. Regina? Wow, Nicole, sorry, I'm just going to jump in. Thank you for sharing. That is an amazing story uh, that you got involved like at, at such a, a young age. You saw the challenge and you took it up. And, and really that spark of you, like being behind it, still comes across today. I think that's amazing. Thank you so much for sharing. Um, Regina, what about you? How did you get involved? And how did you end up where you are now? Well, uh, my journey started at a community college. So um, as you know, I am a librarian. Um, at the time when I joined LCC, that was around, so Lansing Community Colleges, uh, College. So community college are two-year institutions actually in um, the United States and um, that, that grants associate degrees. And historically, um, community colleges are open access institutions. So, you know, we admit anyone and everyone, regardless of their um, socioeconomic status or, um, you know, high school where they come from. So it's basically an open access institution. Um, I started there in 2010 as um, a head of a department. And there was maybe three years into my tenure at uh, that institution, um, there was talk about like, how can we make um, college more affordable for a lot of our students, the students that um, who are attending, uh, you know, that former institution that I was in uh, was like 80% receiving federal financial aid. 
Mm-hmm. So if you think about it, 80% of the student population attending that institution uh, are receiving aid because, you know, of low socioeconomic status. And, and so the cost of textbooks really are uh, an issue, a big issue for, for, for students. So at the time, there was talk about, uh, you know, how are we, how can we better serve the students who are attending our, our institution? And so I uh, pitched in the idea of uh, open educational resources, mainly as a way by which we can address the, the textbook affordability problem that our students are facing and as what we call had mentioned earlier, right? Like, you know, it's it's not unusual for a student to, to spend $200 on just one particular textbook. And so that drove the, the advocacy that I have in my institution. Uh, I led that uh, program and really you know, it, it has it has really grown to be a very successful program, and uh, I was leading that for about four years until I moved to Michigan State University uh, in summer of 2019. So this mm-hmm. is actually a new position that was created because a research institution such as MSU would also want to address its land grant mission of providing, uh, you know, of removing that barrier for for textbook affordability for its students. So I I, I am leading the the OER program now at at MSU, and so far it, it really is uh, gaining a lot of of um groundswell right so i have the support of administration i have the support of students and of course our faculty too are really keen on um, creating uh, open educational resources for our students so i'll talk more about that as we do our as we have our conversation but for now that is how i came to be in in this um, Mm -hmm. arena okay fabulous thank you yeah i'd love to hear more about the difference between the community colleges and the kind of institution you're at right now. Uh, But Nicole, maybe because Regina, you also just mentioned the students. Nicole, can you share a little bit more about the student perspective? Because I think that's uh, that's one one. I mean, I'm I'm basically from Europe, uh, German roots uh, with a bit of a U.S. American in there. But it's not necessarily a common perspective here in Germany, Mm -hmm. at least. So if you could share a bit Mm -hmm. more about that, that would be great. Yeah, so students have been, uh, you know, at the heart of the open education movement in North America since since the beginning, uh, you know, back to the, you know, the, I guess the work that I did at the beginning of my career, uh, working with students across the country, um, you know, back at the time where I could, I guess, maybe more legitimately speak from the student perspective, it's been a while. Um, but, you know, I, I think students uh, student leadership is different in, in different countries and the extent to which students are involved in governance of their institutions. You know, here in the U.S., uh, most institutions have a student government or student union. Uh, in Canada, uh, uh, actually, there's a huge emphasis on, on student leadership and, and um, you know, some student leaders actually treat their positions as, as sort of full-time, full-time jobs advocating for the interests of students. And over the years, uh, students have been involved in activism on their campuses in a number of different ways. Uh, you know, initially, the, the first campaign that I worked on in the, in the sort of mid-2000s was around uh, getting faculty to sign on to a, a sort of a, a statement saying that they support the idea of open textbooks. Uh, later on, we ran a, a van tour <laughs> where we took uh, two giant like mascot costumes, like the kind that you'll see at a sports game of a good textbook and a bad textbook and, and brought them around to campuses across the country and organized events with students uh, to, to generate petitions. And then uh, students have also organized, um, there's a movement called textbook, textbook broke, hashtag textbook broke. 
that mm -hmm. uh, a lot of campuses have organized campaigns around just raising awareness that, that that textbooks are expensive. So you'll see if you if you search the hashtag on Twitter, you'll see students holding signs saying, you know, I spent six hundred dollars on textbooks this semester. You know, when I could have spent that on groceries or um, you know access to food. And you know, I think there's there's such cognitive dissonance that America is, or at least likes to think of ourselves as the, the, the wealthiest country in the world. And yet so many of our students are struggling to, to, you know, even meet their basic needs when going to college. Um, and because a high, higher education is so expensive and requires students to take on so much debt, uh, you know, expenses like textbooks end up being, um, it, you know, having a very large impact on, on, on students, you know, even that, you know, students will buy their textbooks rather than food or vice versa. And, you know, I, I fully recognize from the German perspective, this is wild, because <laughs> um, I know things work very differently um, in, in all of Europe, and then, you know, maybe specifically Germany. Um, so, uh I, I think that student voices are, are such an important part of the conversation. And I know that, you know, you, Regina, have done such a wonderful job working with the student leadership on your campus and on, um, uh, on many campuses, students are involved as, as partners in advocacy for OER initiatives. Um, you know, a lot of times student leaders can get, you know, a meeting with the campus president or chancellor when, you know, somebody who's in a position like Regina's in the library, you know, can't necessarily just, you know, call up the university president and get a meeting. Although I have full faith in Regina that she could walk right in there. And go Regina, go and Regina. <laughs> <laughs> but <laughs> um, uh, I guess more in general. Um, so yeah, students are just, you know, really important partners on that. And, 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 you know, when we start thinking about things like what does it look like to build ed equitable education systems and inclusive education systems, part of that is involving the people who are, you know, served by an institution and the decisions being made about how that institution serves them. And I think uh, there's a long way to go for, uh, you know, higher ed and um, all of it, the education and, and probably everywhere <laughs> toward doing that. Uh, but it's a step that we can all take in our own open education work in terms of thinking about, you know, ways in which you can involve the students who are, are, are impacted by your work and, and helping to co-create it. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Nicole. Thank you. Regina, would you like to jump in? Yeah, um, yeah. And and to, to Nicole's point, I, I cannot stress, you know, the importance of, of having students uh, behind this, this effort. And I've seen that, you know, as, as I've implemented in a two-year institution. So a two-year institution here in the United States, um, like majority of, of the students, the undergraduate students that are attending, who are attending college, go to community colleges just because, mm. you know, the tuition there is not as expensive as four year. Um, a lot of the faculty at uh, a two-year institution are adjuncts or contingent faculty, part-time faculty. And so it is a challenge for this faculty to create uh, OER materials. And so more, more, more especially if, if they do not have the institutional support that mm -hmm. they need to, to do that. And even if, if, if they're not, you know, creating OER, just, just the adoption of an existing OER is also um, labor intensive, not as labor intensive as like creating an OER, but it also necessitates uh, course redesign. So, you know, you need, you need to have that, that support from the institution as well. And what I can see from, from the initiatives that are more successful are those initiatives that have a whole slew of support. Right, whether that you know is from the librarians, from mm. instructional designers, or um, from accessibility uh, experts within the colleges, those are the wraparound services that you know faculty need in order to to 
adapt or create OER for for students. Mm -hmm. And yeah. And Regina, are students at the at community colleges somehow equally vocal or aware or engaged or or is it a different different mindset set of people because you already mentioned also the whole environment is very different also on the teaching side and yeah student advocacy in community colleges differs of course depending on your context right um historically community colleges are commuter institutions meaning there's you know students don't don't necessarily live in dorms and and students uh a lot of them work right are working students and so they don't necessarily stay on campus they stay on campus just to take classes and then they leave because they have jobs right so mm -hmm. it becomes really tricky to mob mo mobilize mobilize students in in a two year institution but it's not impossible because you know a lot of these students also face the barriers that a lot of students from a four year institution also face right so um, when i was um, still in my former institution, I made it a point to, to spread the word to, to our students. There are students out there in community colleges that are who are very committed, you know, who are uh, really strong advocates for, for OER and open education. So I've, I've, I've had uh, a really good success with uh, student participation. Um, just because I I sought them out, right? So yes. you know, in, in just in the library alone, we employ thirty student employees, and so I start with them, and they are really uh, very good advocates. So, uh, but but you know, even even here in in my my present institution now at Michigan State, we have very good uh, student. Uh, participation because our student government really is taking helm um, in, in, in advocacy and helping me out. So for yeah. example, they just passed a bill, a resolution last year advocating for the use of OER in undergraduate courses. And so I've, I've been working with the vice president of the um, student government so that he can, uh, as what Nicole say, you know, when, when he has a regular meeting with the provo, with the president and with all the administrators, you know, they can, they can advocate for this initiative. Mm -hmm. to this to these administrators and they have been so they're really a good advocate for expansion of of your open education programs okay fabulous so it's the network that comes together and, and makes the effort strong yep okay great thank you um since we have an international audience um maybe uh, nicole you could share a bit more about the milestones you've witnessed in the growth of open education yeah so i um i guess thinking about how things so i guess i'll speak specifically to the the u.s national context um i think one of the big milestones for us was in uh 2018 for the first time uh congress uh put funding behind open educational resources and uh through a program that's called the open textbook pilot um from for i, I guess a, a u.s national budget it was a relatively small amount of money it was only i think five million million dollars that year but it has really helped, uh, I, I guess, raise awareness and legitimize the idea of open educational resources. Even though it maybe wasn't that much money, it, it did help get institutions attention and get uh, a variety of different campuses and states to start thinking about sort of bigger projects on open educational resources rather than maybe just sort of smaller uh, smaller campus-based programs. 
And that's really helped accelerate things. And then a number of states have actually invested pretty sizable amount of money in, in supporting OER. And that that's true sort of going back uh, maybe 10 years that, that, that states have been supporting this as a affordability strategy. I think for the first time, um, we got a very significant investment. California put uh, over uh, $100 million behind the development of zero textbook cost degree programs where at the California community college system, which is over a hundred colleges, will develop entire degree or certificate programs that use open educational resources in every single course uh, or other free materials so that students can, can literally get a degree without spending a single dollar on textbooks, which in some countries is normal, <laughs> um, here it is not. Uh, so I think those are some, those are some of the big milestones, uh, from, uh, I guess a U.S. policy perspective. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Regina, can you maybe uh, tell us a little bit more also about the librarian perspective? I think, which yeah. nicely add to the policy level. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and, and to add to that, uh, the growth of, of, librarian and libraries involvement with uh, OER initiative. I, I think that is, is one thing that also is remarkable, uh, the way in which academic libraries are leveraging their infrastructure, their funding, their expertise to support uh, the institution in, in um, developing, implementing, and scaling OER programs, I think that is um, really very crucial. So, and I've seen that growth from just a handful of, of uh, librarians doing the work to, you know, a lot of institutions folding OER in their strategic initiatives. So, so I think that that one is, is really uh, a crucial moment. <laughs> um, and also, I think related to that are uh, the leadership programs that have emerged to uh, facilitate and to provide professional development and training to not just librarians, but to faculty, to instructional designers, um, to, to staff who are uh, doing the work in their own institutions. So we have um, Creative Commons uh, certificate for librarians, for faculty, for uh, galleries, libraries and museum workers. So we have that. And um, Nicole through Spark, right? Spark has a very nationally recognized program for open education leadership. And, and I believe it is important for, uh, you know, these people who are doing the work on the ground to be provided with the necessary training in order to help uh, their institutions move forward because this requires a lot of work and uh, it's not really covered, right, in the curriculum uh, of, of uh, you know, even in colleges of education. So the training is really, really important. And, and to dovetail on the national funding that the government, the federal government has allocated for OER, a lot of institutions also are uh, budgeting enormous amount of money to support this, this program. Mm -hmm. So, um, and, and it's across consortia, it's across uh, multi-institutional collaboration uh, that that has enabled this this partnership to happen. And Regina, it sounds like those leadership programs are also to some degree a signal to everyone, whether it's a lecturer, that you are you're allowed to engage with OER because as you said, it's often not part of your paid job in a way, but it comes on top. So I've heard from colleagues in Italy, for instance, that even librarians are very like unsure whether they should really engage with OER because they don't feel like they have an official mission to engage with the topic. I mean, they could, but it's more work and effort, but there's no official green light. So it sounds like once you have those um, leadership programs in place, and that's also a clear sign that yes, it is an important topic and please do engage. Mm 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, and and to to your point, Tina, that is really true because you know I am speaking from a privileged position, right? Because my my uh, job is specifically to support and to lead the OER program at my institution. But in a lot of of institutions, this is not the case. This is just as you said, an add on to their already full plate. Right, and that is that is the barrier too that a lot of uh, OER uh, advocates in in many many institutions say. And I am mentoring three big institutions as part of my role as faculty for the association, American Association of Colleges and Universities. And it doesn't really matter whether you're a four year or a two-year institution, it's really a matter of how are the the people in power or administration committed to this initiative, Mm -hmm. right? And so it has to be, you know, providing the staff, providing the necessary financial resources to help the people on the ground do Mm -hmm. the best work that they can. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so true, so true. Um, let's maybe move on to what are the biggest trends or challenges you see facing op- open education in the next five years? So let's maybe look ahead a bit. Yeah, Regina, I think that picks up very, very nicely with where where you just ended in terms of thinking about institutionalization of OER. And, you know, there's so many campuses that 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 have successful sort of smaller initiatives that are based on, uh, you know, $10,000, $20,000 of small grants per year that are successful in supporting the faculty who really want to make changes to, to the course materials that they're using to make those changes. But if we're looking at the bigger picture of the, you know, the high cost of textbooks and how, how do we solve that problem in the long term, we really need to be thinking about this as a, a, a systemic problem that, that needs to be solved. And the success of those sort of smaller initiatives have, has shown that OER is not just possible, but actually, in, in, in some cases, actually much better for students, not just in terms of cost, but for supporting innovative pedagogy and access to materials long term. And a big challenge that I think many OER advocates are facing in the US um, is that textbook publishers have pretty rapidly changed their model over the last five years or so. So they've gone from, you know, this this world where we were advocating for OER compared to expensive print textbooks that cost hundreds of dollars to advocating for OER in comparison to uh, digital access deals that publishers are striking with institutions. And the industry has adopted this term called inclusive access. And that term doesn't mean what you think it does. <laughs> um, uh, the, the, the textbook industry uses that term to refer to textbooks that are automatically billed to students. So when they enroll in a course, they get their tuition and fees get charged the cost of that textbook. So they're not paying out of pocket for it, they're charged for it later. And this model has been gaining, uh, I guess, popularity at at institutions across the country. And publishers have been very successful in marketing it as more affordable than the the $200 print textbooks. But the problem is that many students are already paying much less than, than $200 for those textbooks because they're able to buy used books or get a copy of the library or be able to Um, you know, share copies with friends. And this whole system is changing the default to where uh, essentially publishers get the ability to just sort of directly bill every student for access to a textbook. And they claim that the prices are lower and, you know, it makes sense that they are because it's digital. But the problem is that the materials expire at the end of the term. And there's no guarantee that the prices will stay low. 
So in the future, publishers can do what they did, you know, 30 years ago and start raising prices uh, out of control. And this is creating challenges for OER efforts because many uh, decision makers on campuses, so administrators, well-meaning faculty don't understand the difference between open educational resources that are free for everyone to use forever and can be customized. And these automatically build digital textbooks that, you know, in many ways are, uh, I guess, from a faculty perspective, since they don't have to pay for them, <laughs> look very similar. Um, it's, you know, material students get access to on the first day of course uh, in a digital format. So um, I think differentiating between those two models is gonna be a challenge for OER. And I think as advocates for open education, we need to challenge our institutions to think bigger about access to course materials as part of the uh, critical infrastructure of the institution. And the only reason that we're set up in the system where students have to buy their own textbooks is that we had to live, or we used to live in a world where you had to print and ship a book to every student who needed one, but we don't live in that world anymore. <laughs> That's not how it works. And, uh, you know, there are many ways that we can leverage libraries and, and um, uh, you know, uh, other strategies for, you know, investing in, in high quality course materials that everybody can use. So I guess that <laughs> that's the challenge ahead and, and we're working on it. Yeah, yesterday somebody mentioned, uh, I think very fittingly, that textbooks were basically never made for students. They are marketed towards the lecturers and the world has changed, mm -hmm. but the, the strategy on that side has not yet fully changed. So, but yeah, hopefully we'll, we'll make some uh, way in, in that perspective also. Regina, yes. Yeah, and to, to follow up on, on what Nicole mentioned, a lot of this too, the hesitancy of, of uh, faculty to use OER is because they rely on a lot of this interactive uh, materials that go with the with the digital textbook so the homework system um, you know the other personalized learning systems that are uh, available from from publishers and now the OER uh, that that faculty create cannot be able to uh, you know address right and so that that also becomes um, a barrier. Right. Um, and and another challenge that that I see is it's it's still the the finding, you know, we have a lot of repositories uh, out there that have um, this this materials, but uh, it's it's still like when when someone remixes a particular uh, OER or three OERs and come up with a new one. It's still not shared openly, right? To, to everyone, to be, for everyone to, to benefit because it probably is residing in the LMS or uh, the institution doesn't have a repository where they can put that material in. And so the, the finding and the curation is still a challenge. Um, in you know as as what i can i can see and and also that that integration of the use of oer and the adoption of oer to a faculty's tenure and promotion opportunities in in the university because you know a lot of universities probably don't re recognize that as a valid scholarly pursuit right and so yeah. that also becomes a challenge and a barrier um for for educators um but you know there's we can name a lot of challenges but I think for all the challenges that that the OER movement, the OER community, the open community has faced through these years, we have managed to make a difference, <laughs> right? Because it's like uh, the cost of, of, of textbooks that uh, we typically ask our students to budget has considerably gone down. And I think it has to do with, with 
the the conscious effort by by higher education institutions fueled by community colleges to really lower lower that barrier for our students so and and promise promising is really open educational practices open pedagogy moving beyond resources to practice because how can you sell this if you are only relying on the affordability argument right so i think we need to to place it in context of improved student learning and engagement